Welcome to this special edition of the Global Dialogue, the Distinguished Speaker Program of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Council President Patrick Ryan. Today, we celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his leadership of the civil rights movement in America. We are reminded that he was an international figure and was recognized with the award of the 1964 Nobel Prize. On December 10, 1964, he accepted the award at the University of Oslo, where he remarked on the civil rights movement's commitment to nonviolence. He said, sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace and thereby transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. If this is to be achieved, man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. We commend the full speech to your attention along with the many others of his stirring speeches and writings. You can find it posted on tnwac.org. Let me thank our partner in today's program, the American Council on Germany. The ACG is a nonpartisan organization that works to strengthen German-American relations. ACG is a frequent partner in many of the councils of the World Affairs Network. We are grateful for ACG's work with us to foster global affairs awareness. Let me also thank the generosity of our guests today, many who connected via ACG, who made donations to the World Affairs Council when they registered for this event. Your financial support will make programs like this possible, as well as our education outreach work with high school and college students. Thank you. For others who would like to make a gift to the, gift to the council to support our work, or to become a member of the Tennessee World Affairs Council, please visit tnwac.org. On to our important program. We are honored to present this conversation about the Russian threat to Ukraine and the response from the West. It is a rapidly unfolding series of events and there's no better time than today to talk about the crisis that could bring war to Europe. And there's no better authority to give us insights and perspectives on the situation than Ambassador John Kornblum. He joins us from Berlin. We are pleased to have Dr. Thomas Schwartz, Distinguished Professor of History at Vanderbilt University with us in Nashville, who will guide the conversation. I'll hand off to uh, Ambassador uh, Kornblum, who will set the scene for us, and then he and Professor Schwartz will engage in conversation before taking your questions. Please start now to enter your questions for Ambassador Kornblum in the Zoom Q&A panel. Ambassador John C. Kornblum has a long record of service in the United States and Europe, both as a diplomat and as a businessman. He is recognized as an eminent expert on U.S.-European political and economic relations, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe. He served as the U.S. Ambassador to Germany from 1997 to 2001. Before that, he occupied a number of high-level posts, including U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Special Envoy for the Dayton Peace Process, U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Deputy U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and U.S. Minister and Deputy Commandant of Forces in Divided Berlin. Dr. Thomas Schwartz is a Distinguished Professor of History at Vanderbilt University. He is a historian of the foreign relations of the United States with related interest in American politics, the history of international relations, Modern European History and Biography. His most recent book is Henry Kissinger and American Power, a political biography. <clears throat> Earlier in his career, Schwartz was the author of America's Germany, John C. McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany. Ambassador Kornblum, thanks for joining us uh, today from Berlin and the floor is yours for your opening comments. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm pleased to be speaking to you from Berlin, but as you know, I also am a resident of Nashville and so I'm very, very pleased to be talking with the Tennessee World Affairs Council today. Uh, it's actually quite fitting that we're having this discussion today on Martin Luther King's celebration because the world that we're trying to protect in the debates and the, if you will, confrontations with Russia right now is a world which uh, many people put together, including myself, 30 years ago, which for the first time was based on a Western world, that is from the United States all the way to the Russian border, and in fact at the beginning even past the Russian border, 
which was based on the, pres the, the principles which uh, Dr. King held so closely. It was a world based on democracy, on openness, of freedom of choice, of non-interference in internal affairs, of freedom of alliance. Now this may seem all so uh, obvious to most of us, but the fact was, until 1991-92, <clears throat> when all of these documents were put together, Europe had never in its entire thousands of year history known this kind of system. There had been democracies, especially after World War II, many democracies in Western Europe, but the continent had been divided. It had been ruled by a communist dictatorship, before that by a Nazi dis dictatorship, and it had all sorts of societies which in fact were simply emerging into a democratic direction. So it was for all of us and for me personally, since I had worked so much on it, it was a great, great period, the early 1990s, when we really believed that we were building a democratic future, not just for Europe, but for the entire democratic world. We were talking a bit before uh, we came on here and almost all of us who are uh, taking part in this discussion probably have some sort of ancestors in these parts of Europe which uh, saw so much warfare during the 19th and 20th centuries. And so it's very important for us right now to understand why that democracy seems to be fading in parts of Europe, why there is confrontation, maybe even the fact a threat of war, and what our interests are, why we should care about this, and what we can do about it. What we did in 1990 through 1996-97, after the end of the Cold War, was set up a structure of relationships, of negotiations, but also of principles, also of commitments to democracy, to peace and freedom, which everybody, including the new Russian Federation, signed not just begrudgingly, but actually very openly and very positively. I was working on the uh, relationship with Russia in 1996 and 97, spending a great deal of time in Moscow at that time, and I can remember when the people who we were talking to then, be it the prime minister of Russia or be it the, uh, the foreign minister or the diplomats that we were dealing with, they were all thanking us from liberating them from communism. They th felt very strongly that Russia now had to take this opportunity and become part of the modern Western world, not because they had lost to us or that we were better than them, because they knew that it was this modern Western democratic world which had guaranteed both its inhabitants but also the countries around it more freedom and more prosperity than any at any time in history. So that was a very hopeful period. As we know, there have been many ups and downs since then, and we now are in a down period. Uh, Vladimir Putin, for whatever motivations he may have, feels that he needs to push Russia in a traditional way, in a traditional big power imperial way, to reestablish Russia's control over its neighborhood, not to be uh, in, in, interfered with by Western countries, especially the United States. Now, much of this may have to do with Mr. Putin's desire not to have democracy in his country, because if there were democracy, he most probably would not be president anymore. But some of it, it also deals with who Russia is and how they see themselves. And it, 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 in fact, probably demonstrates that they did not feel totally liberated when the Soviet Union came to an end, and why shouldn't they, why shouldn't they after all? And that as the years have gone by, and especially that there has been economic ups and downs in their own country, that a feeling of a need for pride, a need for a sense of Russian history and everything has come back, and Putin is able to use this for his own purposes. Now, the big question which I'm asked quite often is, especially by Americans, is why, do, why should we care about this? Russia is a country which no longer rules the world, no longer has a big empire, <clears throat> is not really a threat to us. Ukraine may be a nice enough place, but it's far away. It doesn't really have anything to do with the center of Western cooperation. And um, it's always been part of Russia anyway, so what's all this, the talking about? Well, the talking is about the fact is twofold. 
First, because we all agreed 30 years ago, and we have been working hard on it, that for the first time in its history, in fact, in its really thousands, 2,000 year history, Europe has known a sense of equilibrium, of peace, of openness, and there is no reason why we should, until recently, have feared that war could break out in Europe, around Europe, or between Europe. Uh, this is now changing a bit. Secondly, there are great parts of Europe, especially what we now call Central Europe, who were the uh, allies of Russia, the, the uh, involuntary allies of Russia during the Cold War, who cherish their democracy strongly. And if there is going to be a questioning of Ukraine's right to be a democracy, then why not Poland? Why not Slovakia? Why not Hungary? Why not the Balkan states? These are all neighbors of Russia. And if Russia has decided that it needs to have a sphere of influence around it, it's going to affect many of the countries who are also part of NATO and part of the European Union. But secondly, even more importantly than that, is the fact that we are coming into a new era. The Europe that we put together 30 years ago was in fact put together 30 years ago, and 30 years is for anybody's lifespan a long time. And uh, things are changing dramatically, as we know. We had never heard the word social media 30 years ago. We didn't know what an iPhone was. We had never thought of live streaming a discussion as we're doing it today. And the changes which have taken place are changes which can be used for the good or they can be used, as we've seen, also for evil. It is very important that the operating system of this new system be a democratic one. And if we're going to guarantee that, we also have to guarantee that the European side of the Atlantic community is also a peaceful and democratic one. And therefore, it is very much in American interest to make sure that peace is maintained in Europe and, it, and make sure that countries such as Ukraine, which want to develop a de democratic system, are given the opportunity to do so. Finally, there is the question of, is there going to be a military confrontation? And of course, nobody can answer that. Uh, Russia is uh, playing a game of chicken, as we say in the United States. We can't be sure what Putin is up to. But I think that one thing that he has already done, unwittingly, I'm sure, is he has strengthened the unity of the Western world against the kinds of pressures that he is exerting. This is good news in its own way. It wasn't quite obvious that this would happen. Maybe some people would say, what do we care? Let's let the Russians do whatever they want. No, that has not been the case. The Western world from the United States to Canada to England to the European continent have been very profoundly uh, speaking with one voice on everything that's going on. We intend to support democracy in the countries who want to be democratic, to recommend that others be democratic if they aren't already, including Russia. And we, we are doing it together. That's very important for America because as you can see, when there is a conflict like this, what happens? The United States becomes the major interlocutor immediately. Putin seems to have no great interest in talking with the French president or the German chancellor. He wants to talk with the president of the United States. So that means that we're drawn into these conflicts, whether we wish it or not. And that means that we have to understand what they are, and we also have to be ready to deal with them. So I think that um, we, well, I know that we can't predict what's going to happen, but I do think that the United States and its allies are not on a bad track here. We have been working very closely with each other, and I think that we will be putting, to, we are putting a common front towards the Russians, and we'll see how they deal with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kornblum. Um, there are a number of questions and areas I'd like to pose to you to see, uh, get your reflections on and your thoughts. Um, certainly, uh, you've stressed, or you stressed toward the end of your remarks, the relative unity of the West in facing the situation in Ukraine. Uh, my question to you is a sort of uh, what does what will that matter? In effect, if 
we have Russian aggression in the Ukraine, either uh, seizing additional territory, uh, continuing cyber attacks, and the West imposes sanctions that seem to have relatively little impact. Um, will the process itself have uh, be discredited? And in a sense, do we face the problem that multilateralism, as uh, important as it is to the American foreign policy process, is ultimately empty if it cannot exert or co create a type of pressure on uh, Russia through economic sanctions? And here I'd I'd like you actually to reflect a bit on whether you think um, the administration's position that sanctions will be imposed is strong enough, given that we will not specify which sanctions we will use. Yes, very interesting. Well, um, if Putin does decide to do something militarily, and especially if he decides to do something which is, shall we say, less than a full-scale military um, invasion, but rather something as he did in Crimea uh, eight years ago, it was going to present us with a major challenge, no question about it. We had a similar challenge. It was a different world, but it was a similar challenge um, 35 years ago when the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies invaded Czechoslovakia for the same reason, because Czechoslovakia was becoming too democratic and they just couldn't stand that. Now, what did we do after that? We put sanctions on them. We put economic sanctions on them. We blocked them from international uh, activities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we also continued to push on our idea of what Europe should be like. And uh, one of my uh, greatest and most exciting experiences was to take part in the quadripartite negotiations on Berlin, which came up with the first sort of so-called solution to the Berlin issue. The agreement which sealed that negotiation was signed almost to the day, three years, only three years after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. In other words, we shouldn't assume that a regime such as the Soviets of that time or uh, Putin today is endlessly flexible, endlessly able to take uh, advantage of what we're doing. I think sanctions are useful, but I don't think it's the only thing that we can do. We also need to be pushing some kind of contact and dialogue with them, which is what, Thomas, you know a lot about Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger was already planning his detente, and so was Willie Brandt at, at the time when this was happening. And so we did dialogue also. I think, it's, but it, your question is still very good because you can't know how it's going to turn out. And much of it will be to depend on the skill and the statesmanship of the Western leaders. So far, I think they've been doing quite well. But who knows? Hmm. This is, Can I this pose? Is, okay. I, I was going to pose a question connected more to your presence in Berlin, namely, to what extent do you see any German willingness? to sacrifice um, for Ukraine in any manner. In particular, of course, in the United States, the issue is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and the question of whether that should be, in some sense, suspended by any type of Russian military action. Um, what do you see as uh, the ability of the new German government to take decisive action? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, first, the new German government has been on board completely in the measures we've been taking so far. But you're right, the Nord Stream pipeline, the gas pipeline coming across the Baltic Sea has been an, uh, some, uh, a, a area of confrontation and, and debate for some time. Just today, this morning in the newspapers, and this shows you something about the situation here, two of the partners no, one of the partners in, and the CDU, who were the opposition party, came out very strongly saying that if Putin moves in any way militarily that the Nord Stream pipeline is finished. Um, the chancellor, Mr. Schultz, has not said that. And uh, he has, in fact, tried to argue that he has no more influence over the, the project, that it's now being decided by the EU, which is, to a certain extent, the correct. So I think Germany is going to be the key, as Germany, as you would know well, very well know, is very often the key to what's going on here. 
And uh, so far, it seems that the Germans are hanging together with their Western allies, but they do have this deep engagement in Russia, and they do have a deep psychological dependence on good relations with Russia. And so we can't be sure. We'll wait and see. Do you find that they read Mr. Putin differently than we do in the United States in terms of his willingness to uh, act in an aggressive manner? And uh, do you find that they have a tendency to be far more understanding of Russian concerns for uh, their citizens in Ukraine or their Russian speakers in Ukraine? Um, <clears throat> yes and no. There was six months ago more of that. Now it's not so strong. He's. Uh, I think this is another long discussion we could have. I think Putin is playing his own hand very poorly. And if he wanted to make sure that Ukraine would separate itself from Russia, he's achieved that. Ukraine wants nothing more to do with Russia. Uh, and so, and, and the same is the case in Germany. But, you know, again, you, Tom, you're is more of an expert on this than anyone. The, 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 the Germans just don't find it possible to be totally confrontational with Russia for various reasons. And they're still behaving that way. Uh, it, in one of this morning's papers that I was reading, there was a poll of readers. Should the Nord Stream pipeline be built or not? 70% said yes. And so this, this is not, there is not an anti-Russian, anti-Soviet sentiment here as there is in Poland or certainly in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. But I think that Germans understand completely what's at stake here. And I think that you will find that, uh, that they will support, maybe not quite as enthusiastically as others, but they will support what, what in fact needs to be decided if, if, if it doesn't so need to be decided. Um, is there a sense in Europe that um, a failure to respond adequately to a Russian action could trigger actions by, by other bad actors around the world? And here I'm particularly wondering whether Europeans see any connection between their response and the West's response in Ukraine to what might happen with China and Taiwan or Iran or, or North Korea or other countries in terms of their willingness then to undertake risks um, because of a, of, of a feeling that the West is too divided, too polarized, and too uh, caught up with its own issues to actually act um, effectively anymore? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think probably it's, it's accurate to say that there's not too much focus on that right now. For whatever reason, the Europeans have defined relations with China as an American problem even though China is exerting tremendous, tremendous efforts in Europe, and especially in Germany, by the way, uh, they see China as being far, far away and uh, being a good market for German industrial products, but they don't feel themselves politically or, or militarily involved in what happens. Now, if there were, for example, uh, we, we sometimes hear the example of uh, Taiwan, uh, having a similar role for the Chinese that Ukraine does for Russia. If the Chinese were to sense weakness on our side and try to do something against Taiwan, I think you would find the Europeans uh, quite interested in, and willing to act. But right now, I, don't, I can't tell you that they uh, are taking a great deal of interest in what's going on mm -hmm. in, the, in the, East, the Far East. Um, one of my friends, uh, has made the argument to me that one of the things you see with Putin's behavior is a connection between the price of energy and Russian aggressiveness. And I'm wondering if that um, is something that is part of the discussion, in the sense that uh, because Russia, uh, the prices of oil and gas have gone up and European dependence uh, on Russian supplies is, is there, that this is, this is a way of fuel for Putin's behavior um, that uh, is a problem for uh, the West in general, and that the, the dep this dependence and also the simple price rises that give Putin that uh, extra cash in order to undertake such actions. I think that's probably true. I think that uh, there are, this is maybe interesting, there are essentially two different strains of discussion of Putin right now. One of them is, comes, uh, if I may put it this way, from the academic community quite a lot, is to inform us on the, the dynamics of Russian history 
and why Russia has always been an expansionist country that it needed the expansionist for its own national feeling that, uh, you know, the original Muscovites were in fact not Russian at all, but were Scandinavian and they had to build up their own uh, identity there. That's one train of thought that you get quite a lot these days. The other is the, shall we say, social uh, political side of Putin. Uh, he is a dictator, obviously. He's also a very rich dictator. He is also a dictator whose popularity is uh, fading in his own country. And that uh, there are some people who say this, is, this has nothing to do with the Muscovy or Russia or conquering Siberia. It has to do with Putin and his desire to survive. I don't know. I'm not that much of an expert. I think you can see both things there. I think there is a sense of Russianness, which is very strong, which is still being felt. And, and he has, I think, successfully played on the idea that, no, we're not just going to be another Western country having the Americans tell us what to do. We're going to be a separate power, and the Americans have to treat us as a separate power. That may be true. But also, of course, he is a you know, we can say it, he's a criminal. He's, he's, he does, he suppresses human rights. He has suppressed other countries. He has money stocked, stashed all over the world. And so he obviously, and he and the group around him obviously want to stay in power. And just when you're a little bit on the, on the uh, downward track, finding a good place to attack overseas is not a bad thing. He's not the first leader who's done that. It's been done quite often in the world. And so it's hard to say. I, I, I'm going to give you, after talking for three or four minutes, and I'm going to say I don't know. <laughs> but I, I yeah. think that um, both of these things play a role, and I think that it makes it more difficult for us because we can't simply say this is a military threat or we can't simply say this is a sagging leader. It's a mixture of both. Um, you have mentioned, and I want to I wanna ask one more question and then see if Pat might want to, uh, bring in some of the questions that are coming from the audience. Well, you've mentioned Ukraine itself, or Ukraine. Um, to what extent does there exist a potential fifth column of sorts of Russian-speaking <clears throat> Ukrainians who, who would welcome a Russian uh, presence in the eastern Ukraine? Is that been changed by uh, Putin's behavior, or does it still exist, and is it, is it still a vulnerability of the Ukrainian state? Well, first, I think uh, one thing that Putin has achieved is to uh, stimulate and develop quite strongly a, U a Ukrainian sense of national identity, which they may or may not have had before. Secondly, the role of the Russian speakers is a very controversial issue in Ukraine also. I think, I think it's safe to say that at the beginning of its independence period, Ukraine felt so uh, pushed, downtrodden by the Russians that they passed very strict language laws, which basically told people they couldn't speak their native language, which doesn't work in any country. In our own country, we know how many people hang on to their native language. And so they made a lot of mistakes, in other words. Uh, but I think, and, and I have, if I, I'm gonna mention this, uh, you and Patrick, you know who I'm talking about. My wife, Helen Oksana is her name, who has spent the last three years doing OSCE missions in Ukraine. And she has reported to me that the Russian speakers are t fully engaged Ukrainians. And that's, that's, you know, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. <laughs> it's also true, by the way, if you go back now 30 years to the election data, of the referendum, they did after all hold a referendum to see whether they wanted independence or not. And it was not uniform across the country, but even in the heavily Russian speaking areas, it was more than 50%, sometimes 60% wanting independence. And in the, in the two so-called runaway provinces, some of the results there, I've looked into this, were in the 90% in those provinces, not everywhere, but in some of the parts of it. So I think probably this, this idea that Ukraine is sort of being torn apart by language differences is probably not really true. Of course, it's true to a certain extent, but it's not really true as, as far as the existence of the country is concerned. And that what 
Putin really has been doing is giving them a sense of national unity, which they may not have had in the same extent before he started with his various uh, exercises. Okay, um, Pat, do you want to uh, bring in some questions? Sure. From our audience? Uh, yep. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Tom. Uh, Ambassador Kornblum, thanks uh, again for being with us uh, today. We, we have a, a very large uh, audience, a lot of interest in, uh, in this topic, obviously. Uh, let me uh, share with you a question from Angela Weck, who's uh, executive director of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council. Um, Angela asks uh, about the uh, support for Putin in, uh, in Russia. What kind of risk does he face when he claims the need to invade Ukraine while calling them Russia's brothers and part of Russia in terms of a common history and culture? Do Russians in Russia support his tactics? Does he control the media enough to control the message? Well, that again, it's, it's hard to measure, of course, because you don't have too many sources of uh, objective opinion. But the, um, if you take the anecdotal evidence, including the numbers of demonstrations, including the last election campaign where he, uh, my wife was already on, off, almost on her way to go to monitor the elections in Russia when Putin essentially kicked the OSCE out and said, we don't want you meddling in our internal affairs. That showed that he was worried about what the, what the you know, foreign monitors might hear. I think there is a, um, a well-known person, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was once the richest man in Europe, who I've gotten to know quite a bit. And he is now, interestingly enough, working to build democratic institutions in Russia. And Putin lets him do it, by the way. It's very interesting. He asks us continuously, he just gave an interview in a German newspaper where he said it again, not to underestimate the democratic spirit in Russia, that it is a very independent country, independent people, and they have no sense of, of patriotism in the sense that we would understand it, but they at the same time feel very strongly about being treated fairly. So he, he really almost begs us to, to say Russia is not a lost cause. I'm willing to take him at face value on that. Um, I worked, I had an interesting uh, experience. I never lived in Russia and I don't speak Russian, but I worked for about 40 straight years with Russians doing common things, for example, here in Berlin. And um, I found them almost to a person to be very open and fair-minded and freedom-oriented. They were, of course, uh, I had some, I won't go into it now, but very interesting discussions with some of them after the fall of the Soviet Union, when they came up to me and said, it's so nice that we can finally talk to each other openly. So there's, I think there's more, there's more democracy in Russia than many of us want to believe, but it's very hard when you have a system which suppresses it at every corner. Thanks uh, for that, Ambassador. I have uh, one question here from uh, Nick McCall in Knoxville about sanctions. And uh, he uh, asks if uh, the imposition of sanctions are likely to provoke armed conflict and gives the example of the imposition of oil and steel sanctions on Japan uh, in the 1940 uh, era, pardon Japan's decision to go to war. So uh, Nick asks, uh, what do you think the likelihood is uh, that the sanctions may embolden Putin to uh, further uh, uh, conflict? Well, I, I'll just say my own opinion is I'm not a big fan of sanctions. Uh, I have uh, in various times where I was in various places, I had to uh, either think them up or, or uh, manage them. And I never felt that they were a really very good tool. I just say that off the top of my head. So I, maybe I agree with your uh, our colleague there, that uh, they're not the best thing to do it. But sanctions are usually used when you can't think of anything else to do. Let's be very blunt about it. And this was the case in World War II. We didn't know what to do about Japan in 1938 and 39. So we said, okay, they can't buy steel from us. That'll show them. Well, as you say, it didn't show them. It just made them matter. And so, uh, but sanctions are right now, one thing that we can do without um, upsetting too much else. There are some other sanctions which could be taken, 
which uh, and and uh, President Biden uh, made a very uh, direct statement to Putin apparently in his last conversation, saying, "I have I can do things by myself which would really hurt you." He probably was thinking of the SWIFT system, which is the uh, international global financial payment system. But other people have come out and say, "Well, if you talk about shooting yourself in the foot, if we but took Russia out of the SWIFT system, it would, it would to raise, be turmoil in the, in, the, in the international financial markets for a long time to come. So um, I don't think, in this case, I don't think the sanctions have made Putin matter. I think, however, they've made him prouder because the fact is that he has swallowed the sanctions that we've made so far. And in fact, um, he maybe even made the Russian economy stronger by substituting home produced things for imports. And uh, so I, I actually don't think they've had very much effect. Do you think yeah. the administration, do you think the administration was correct to uh, leave out any sort of military responses, um, even non, not necessarily US troops, but certainly additional weaponry, something like that as part of the response to, to, the, to any military action? Well, I do, yes, but I'm not necessarily a majority of people who believe it. There's a, there's a, um, a feeling that if we got too much into the military side, that it would then become a military confrontation, which nobody really wants. Uh, it would be let's be let's be frank about it. If he, if Putin started, not with a major attack about, on Ukraine, but maybe for example, just taking the two provinces and setting up governments there, and et cetera. And, and, and having them off as he did with uh, Crimea, that would put us in a very difficult situation. So uh, uh, people who say we should be tougher should, should think about what the follow-up would be. And at a certain point, the follow-up would probably then be a major confrontation, which nobody really wants. I mean, we have enough things going on. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We have the climate falling apart around us. Uh, we have all sorts of things going on in our countries that we, the last thing we need is some kind of war. So I think the president is being quite balanced on this, uh, being tough, but at the same time understanding that uh, pushing it towards a military conflict is in nobody's interest. Ambassador, we have uh, questions from Lisa Kissel and Robert Kapenji, uh, and I'll, I'll combine the two. They, they deal with their recent events. Uh, Lisa asks, what do we know about the apparent cyber attack on Ukraine? and uh, importantly, its significance. And Robert uh, asks about the reports that Russia uh, may be hinting at the uh, deployments of weapon systems in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, what, what are your views on those two reports? Well, I know more or less the same thing that you all know, reading in the newspaper. But we know that the Russians have been using this, the cyber weapon a lot over the past five or so years. Wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me at all. It wasn't reported very much, but already in 2014 or 15, the entire Estonian uh, uh, computer, internet, Wi-Fi system just blacked out for six hours or something like that, clearly done by Russian in interference. So the Russians can do this. They have very good mathematicians, very good uh, computer people in Russia. It's just a shame that they're being used for nefarious purposes rather than for making uh, contributions to the, uh, to the overall uh, technological world. But um, I don't know anything more than anybody else does, but it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case. Um, as for, what was, I forgot the second question. Uh, the, uh, the, the hints that uh, Russian military oh, yeah. deployments uh, to the Western I take, Hemisphere. I take that as, uh, you know, just talk for talk's sake. Uh, I think the last time the Russians tried that, it didn't turn out very well for them. And Mr. Khrushchev was out of office two years later. Uh, and so I, I don't, I just, I think that's almost a joke, actually. Very interesting to follow, if you can, is the, um, are the statements of the foreign minister, Mr. Lavrov, who's a very smart person. We knew him, I worked personally with him in the 90s on the Bosnian stuff when he was the Russian ambassador to the United Nations. And in those days, we used to say, there is the kind of modern Russian, the smooth, Western-oriented, liberal Russian that we want to see happening. 
all of a sudden he becomes the, uh, the ogre of, of Russian diplomacy. Uh, but if you listen to him, I, what, I think what you hear is resentment. Resentment somehow that Russia isn't up there with the big boys. And this is an element which I might have mentioned earlier, but neglected to do so, that as the world is now evolving, and as the world is clearly evolving into the big two, China and the United States, Russia is being increasingly, maybe not ignored, but sort of pushed to the side. And I think this probably has something to do with Putin's behavior also. And he says, well, you think you could ignore me? No, you can't. Look at what I can do to you. And, uh, and, and so this talking about, oh, yes, we can send some troops to Venezuela or Cuba or wherever, they tried that. And they got uh, more than a bloody nose. They got really pushed back pretty hard. So I don't think they're going to do that. I think that's just, that's just empty talk that they're... they're I think that they sense, and there's, again, a certain truth to this, that the West is a little bit disoriented, partially because of Corona, partially because of many other things going on, and uh, that they have a chance to, uh, to uh, catch us off balance. And you can, you can see in the way they're talking about things that they're starting to like it. They're starting, and I, I take these comments about Venezuela and Cuba almost being them having fun with us. Uh, they they know they wouldn't do that, and they, what what would it bring them? Nothing. They could they could pull Venezuela out of its economic troubles, which is nobody probably can do that. And so um, I don't take too much lend too much credence to that kind of stuff. Can I, can I follow up here? Can I follow up here and just ask you if you think there is a way for Putin to come out of this particular uh, period of confrontation, a uh, saving face, but without a with without taking military action. Is there, uh, or is in a way, if he doesn't do anything, would he suffer from that? Or is his situation such that he could simply decide, well, this nothing's happened, but we'll go back to the frozen conflict? Well, he's probably going to want some kind of bone, shall we say, something which shows that he was right, that he got gathered, he got some kind of additional security guarantees or something like that. The discussions that Deputy Secretary Sherman has been having have been going in this direction. I'll be very honest, I'm a little bit nervous about this because I don't think that we should give too much credence to Putin's complaints. There's really not much of truth there. But at the same time, if there is a way that we can find to give him you know, some cover, uh, give him uh, the ability to say that, uh, okay, I raised my point and the, and the West took my uh, points and, and helped me out of it, that, that would be probably the, if you're talking about what diplomacy could do, that would be what could happen. What we can't do is ever promise that we won't expand NATO. That is in the original NATO Charter of 1949. And in fact, NATO, when it, NATO has, I think, 27 or 28 members now. It started with 10 or 12. So it has expanded considerably. And one of the biggest expansions, of course, was to include West Germany in 1955. So we can't say that we would never expand NATO. And in fact, you notice the, Swins, the Finns and the Swedes came out real fast and saying, Russia's not going to tell us whether we want to join NATO or not. Mm -hmm. So that we couldn't do, but we can give him all sorts of things, you know, including arms control negotiations and, and maybe confidence building measures and things like that. The question is, is he ready to say, to take yes for an answer that nobody knows? He probably doesn't know. We have uh, a couple of questions that are related. Uh, Dr. Winfred uh, Schmitz uh, asks about uh, offering NATO membership to Russia. Uh, I know that's been talked about in the past and uh, probably that ship has sailed, but uh, wouldn't uh, that be uh, uh, a way to uh, ameliorate the uh, the issues with the uh, eastward advance? And uh, related to that, um, Klein Preston asked, do you believe NATO's advance eastward towards Russia is the cause of NATO's, uh, of Russia's position regarding Ukraine and Ukraine's decision to join NATO? Well, um, as I mentioned, I was, 
one of the chief negotiators of the entire arrangement with Russia, 1996-97. And we, the United States, wanted to include in the documents, whatever you want to call them, a perspective for Russian membership in NATO, you know, based on things happening in the right way, etc. The Europeans were not in favor of it. And the reason that it was given, I can remember very well the discussion that was given to us was, well, if we offer them membership in NATO, they also might want to join the European Union. And we simply couldn't swallow them. They're too big for us. It'd be like the United States wanting to join the European Union. So we didn't make that offer. If you read James Baker's uh, memoirs, but also the book by Peter Baker on James Baker, which is I can highly recommend, um, Baker thought about this, and there are some, some conversations that I also wasn't aware of until I read the book uh, that uh, about this. And I personally would have been much in favor of that. Uh, I was, I can say this here, I was the, the, the main drafter of the charter for the NATO Russian Council. And I had a different concept for the council than it turned out to be. I wanted it to be a mutual operation with Russia. Instead, it turned out to be 25 NATO ambassadors confronting one single Russian and telling him what a bad guy he was. It was not a successful operation, I'm sorry to say. I'm not saying that that would have changed history had we been more open on the NATO-Russia Council, but we could have handled it a lot differently. We could have, in fact, welcomed the Russians into our arms, so to speak. But we didn't. We treated them as supplicants. We treated them as a sort of a foreign body who had to learn how to be democratic. It wasn't, it wasn't a good scene, if I could put it that way. And so should we have offered them membership? I think we should have, but it just wasn't in the cards. Now, the, the other uh, question, did our, did our expansion lead all to this? This has been debated almost from the day that NATO was first enlarged with the Poles and the Czechs uh, uh, almost 30 years ago. I, again, was a big part of this. I was a very strong believer in this. There is a book which was put out by Dan Hamilton of uh, SICE, Johns Hopkins University, in which he, he did a very long seminar, which I took part in, and had all sorts of different people, including Russians, talk about NATO enlargement. It gives you a pretty good picture. Our view in those days, I can say this in the, in the halls of the American Council of Germany was twofold. First, we felt that we owed the Baltics, the Czechs, the Poles, the Hungarians something for the way they had suffered as being part of the Warsaw Pact. We wanted democracy to go as far as we could. We tried to ameliorate it so that Russia would be able to live with it. It didn't work so well, but I'm still very proud that we now have, we have a democratic community which stretches from, shall we say, the Russian-Estonian border all the way to the islands of the Aleutian Islands where the United States and Russia meet each other. And that is a, that is a democratic community which spans two-thirds of the globe. So I, I think we should be very proud of this. And I don't think that um, anything that we could have done would have, would have made it any worse. Uh, the other point, and this is where we're talking about the American Council in Germany, one of the biggest, biggest supporters of NATO enlargement was a person called Volker Ruhe, which uh, some of you may have heard of. He was German defense minister for some time. And his line to us was, you can't leave us hanging out there by ourselves. NATO has to be to the west of us. A very, I thought, prescient and very important concept, and that was part of our concept. Uh, when Germany looked east, it should see the west. And uh, that we were able to achieve that. And I think today, 30 years later, we can be very proud that, that and Germany can be very proud of the way that it has integrated itself, not just with France and Italy and Belgium, but also in the, with the eastern countries. So I think that was one of the main, and then it was followed, of course, by the expansion of the European Union which gave these countries the economic and social contacts, which you couldn't get through NATO. So I think that the, that the whole NATO enlargement was 
a major victory for democracy. Did it make some Russians angry? Maybe later on it did. We could have a long discussion of what was done right or wrong um, in the years after, after 2000, for example. But uh, Ambassador, think... let, me, let me just ask on, on that note, uh, yesterday on the uh, Fareed Zakaria show, Mr. Peskov, the spokesman from the Kremlin, said that uh, at the time of the German reunification, Gorbachev was given the promises that uh, there wouldn't be expansion uh, to the east. There was nothing uh, uh, put in writing, but uh, it was a verbal guarantee. And that's uh, one of the irritants that uh, remains with uh, the I Russians. Know. Yes. Well, how do you say he's lying public, uh, politely? <laughs> he's lying and he knows he's lying. I, I uh, think Gorbachev, that that's, that's how you do it. Gorbachev himself said that no promise was ever made. James Baker in his various memoirs and in the Peter Baker book talks about this in, in great detail. I again was on the scene. I was uh, uh, one of the drafters of the London Declaration in 1990. And when we talked about the new alliance and in that declaration, we reach out to the countries. We say we are no longer enemies. We reach out to you. We want to be your friends. We want to work with you. There was never a talk of NATO enlargement really until the mid 90s. And there were two According to uh, what one reads, I had never had a discussion with him about it. Uh, President Clinton felt very strongly about enlarging NATO, but there were many people in the US government who didn't, who didn't want to do it. But secondly, there was strong pressure from the Central Europeans, the Poles, the Czechs, the Hungarians. And as I mentioned, the German defense minister was very strong. And I think Helmut Kohl was too. I don't remember him ever saying anything, but I think he probably was very strong about it. So, so all of this is, is trying to rewrite history, and, but there is nothing that NATO has ever done to Russia which uh, should make the Russians feel that they were being pressed. We have never threatened them. We have never put, just to give you an example, we have never put short-range missiles into Kaliningrad, which is this little small corner of Russia on the Polish border. We have never done what the Russians have done. They have missiles in Kaliningrad, which could hit Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, without anybody ever having a chance to, to, to get the boots on, so to speak. So they have, in fact, been building a cordon sanitaire around us and threatening us with things such as the short range missiles, where the United States, when the Cold War ended, the United States had about 200,000 troops in Europe. At the moment, if we got all the truck drivers and the people working at McDonald's, we might get 40,000. And the number that we have in Eastern Europe, which the Russians say are such a big threat to them, are in the hundreds, not in the thousands. And they are, according to the agreement that we agreed with the Russians in 1997, there is no permanently stationed American, or NATO, in fact, presence in the former Warsaw Pact countries. So we have actually been very careful about this when the Russians haven't. So. Uh, he's Mr. Peskov is, you know, he's got his talking points, but uh, they they really don't uh, make much sense. Uh, we have a question going back to the energy uh, issue and uh, Professor Schwartz asked you about Nord Stream, but there's a, a follow up here about the uh, possibilities of other countries supplementing uh, European uh, energy needs. And uh, there was a, uh, a broadcast with uh, uh, a Polish official was uh, representative of uh, the question. He, he talked about LNG shipments going into ports that were ready to receive American uh, LNG. Uh, and the question from uh, Joachim uh, Joachim uh, Werner is uh, uh, about the capacity. And, and uh, I know you're not an energy expert, but what, what's your view on uh, cutting the uh, the ties of the energy and, and what might be done to uh, prevent uh, shortages in Europe? Well, believe it or not, I'm more of an expert than you think I am because I had <laughs> worked on some big energy projects over the years. Um, Apologies. No, that's all right. Uh, you know, it's, um, there's lots of gas in the world and it's a declining asset because alternative energy is coming online. So there are lots of people who want to sell their gas. There's no reason for Europe to ever worry about having enough gas. Uh, one of the projects that I was working on, this is now 2013, so it's nine years ago, 
was to try and build some um, so-called liquefaction harbors in Germany so that Germany could uh, accept more LNG. And nobody wanted to build them in Germany because they said, we've got Russian gas. I was on the scene in a much earlier uh, uh, incarnation. I was the head of the Central European Department in the State Department when Ronald Reagan got into a big fight with the Germans about the large diameter pipe that was sold for to build the first pipeline in 1982. He finally gave up. And, and the Germans said, well, don't worry. Um, natural gas, will, the Russian gas will never be more than 10 or 15 percent of European consumption. Right now it's 49 percent. And so there's been lots of mistakes made on the European side here. Germany giving up nuclear energy too fast was a major mistake. Uh, and so um, the, the pipeline was, is, was planned and built partially for Russian strategic reasons, I believe, but also for the economic benefit of certain large German firms. They've, I think now, uh, un unhappy that they took this step, but they did. And maybe the Russians aren't so happy about it either, but it, it, it was planned in a different era when building another pipeline to Russia didn't seem to be such a threatening thing. Now, of course, it is. Sure. Uh, I've got uh, just two more questions as we're uh, running uh, close on time here, and then I'll uh, ask uh, Professor Schwartz to uh, uh, come in with anything that uh, we might have missed in, in this uh, brilliant conversation. A uh, question from uh, Jack McCall uh, it goes to the, the question of Putin's uh, choice of timing and using the crisis to advance other ends uh, such as further separating uh, Europe from the United States uh, and NATO and driving a wedge in the alliance and sensing that uh, to what extent uh, Putin enjoys meddling in U.S. domestic politics. Uh, you know, the timing of this is, as you mentioned, uh, there's, there's a lot of things uh, uh, President Biden has on his plate right now. Yeah, well, um, this goes back really to Lenin and before Lenin. Uh, the Russians were always masters at, uh, at uh, whatever word you want to use, meddling, in, in doing propaganda, doing special operations. Um, there are many things that happened in the Western Europe in the 1980s and 90s, which were essentially financed by the Russian Soviet Union, for example. Uh, and uh, so it's not, you know, they, look, Let's, let's try and, and look at it totally from their point of view, because it's very useful to do that. They are a very big country, but a very also uh, loosely, shall we say, organized country. And uh, they are continuously worried about incursions from outside. That's part of Russia, that is part of Russia's history. And they uh, are especially worried when Europe becomes unified, when it becomes democratically unified, and when the United States and Europe mount such a major competition that Russia can't hope to keep up. That's the way it is right now. Russia in the, in the world, be it the digital world, be it the artificial intelligence world, any of these areas of modern technology, Russia really isn't playing much of a, of a role. So I think that, that they are continuously trying to do two things. First, they are trying to separate the European Union, to try to undermine its unity. They usually do that well enough by themselves, so they don't need the Russians, but uh, the Russians uh, play, play their role too. And with the United States, it's simply a case of, of wanting to be seen as an equal. And uh, our European friends have been quite perturbed by the fact that most of the discussions on this issue have been taking place between Russia and the United States. I can understand that they were perturbed. I would be too in their shoes. But even more perturbing is the fact that Putin simply doesn't care to talk to them. He focuses on the big boys, and that's the United States and increasingly China. And for, for the rest of them, even the, the powerful Germans are, for him, just medium-sized countries who uh, he, he doesn't take to, so too seriously. So uh, his goal of separating Europe and making it less unified, less functioning, and less a threat to him is a major one. 
And of course, simply being seen as an equal of the United States is, is for him, I'm sure, in his own ego, a very, very important factor. Now, you've mentioned China, and we have a, a question from Klein Preston. Do you believe the sanctions against Russia will drive Russia further into partnership with China? And in the last year, we've seen conversations between uh, Putin and uh, Xi Jinping about strategic partnerships <clears throat> and working together and, and uh, positioning the United States as a common uh, uh, foe. Uh, what, what do you see evolving in the, uh, the Beijing-Moscow uh, uh, orbit? Well, they'll try as much as they can to, uh, to set up a alternative reality to the Western world and to try and push the United States into a corner. There's no question about that. But the fact is they don't really like each other very much. The Chinese are bordering on disdainful of the Russians. And the Russians are always worried that the Chinese are somehow going to uh, try and take parts of Siberia or whatever from them. Uh, they have a, a common project, which is also a common dividing project, which is North Korea. Uh, and so uh, I don't think that we have to worry too much about that part of it, that there's all, all of a sudden going to be a, a, uh, you know, a pan-European-Asian alliance of China and Russia. They, that they, they tried that a couple of times and it never worked. But I do think that they have more than enough potential, certainly China, but also Russia, to um, disrupt our new digital world that's being built, to disrupt um, global supply chains, to, uh, to try and uh, get other countries to, uh, to have a different point of view of what should be going on. They can't really take it apart because they don't have enough reach to do that, but they can be very disruptive. So it's very much in our interest to uh, keep the two of them uh, not from being partners, where it doesn't matter that much, but to keep them under control. And that means, of course, that we have to make sure that, uh, that China understands where its interests are. Because just my one final point, perhaps, the big difference between now and 1960 or 1970 is that China is a fully integrated member of the global economic system. And it needs this in in integration to meet its tremendous population needs at home. If you, if you talk for a China, with a Chinese official for more than 15 minutes, he'll say, remember, we're a developing country, and what you see in Shanghai is not China. Well, there's some truth to that. So China has, there's no way that China can break its ties. You know, virtually every smartphone sold in the United States is made in China, for Pete's sake. There's no way that China could, could, uh, could totally break its ties with the United States. But there is a lot of ways that it can disrupt those ties. And they can go up to the point of confrontation. And you can see that they've been doing this. I'm also, I've been doing this a long time, and I also get a little bit suspicious, and both Putin and Xi are in this category, of people who essentially appoint themselves president for life. If you do that, you're worried. You're worried of that you may not survive. You know, you may not be in office anymore, but you may not be terribly healthy after that. Or secondly, uh, that uh, your regime won't survive. And so, and, and only you, of course, the great leader can keep it going. Both of them are now seeing themselves as the great leader. That to me is a sign of weakness and a sign not that should make us happy because, you know, that could lead as we have with Putin to disruption of a kind that we really don't want to deal with. Uh, Professor Schwartz, I'm going to uh, slip one more question in here before uh, handing, handing it to you for uh, your closing questions. Um, uh, Wolfram uh, Rodi Libanau uh, says, uh, thanks to Ambassador Kornblum, and that uh, he, he mentions he met you some years ago at Bob Yar Memorial near Kiev. Uh, he asks about pressure uh, from Russia on uh, Ukraine. And you talked about the Russian speakers in, in Ukraine identifying uh, as as Ukrainians. But uh, give us a little more sense of the view from Kiev uh, over this whole uh, press uh, that uh, the Ukrainians remain within the Russian sphere. Well, um, they were, after all, a part of the Russian sphere for 300 or more years. 
And there are lots and lots of common ties, probably families now who can't see each other because of the tensions. So Ukraine's not an enemy of Russia. That's the other point that Putin keeps trying to argue that uh, Ukraine is somehow its enemy. Well, it's not an enemy at all, but it's a threat because it is doing, I think, for all of the problems that Ukraine has, including the corruption, which is still a big thing, Ukraine is becoming a Russian country, a Western country. If you go to Ukraine, which I do, you know, fairly often, you're not in Russia. You feel more like you're in Slovakia or uh, Slovenia or someplace like that. It's it's they're, they're, in fact their language is a more Southern Slav, Slav language than a Northern Slav language, and so this is the the threat. If you believe, I talked a few minutes ago about you have the geopolitical analyst of Russia, if you believe in the geopolitical analysis of Russia, that it needs to maintain its sense of being an empire in order to maintain its national identity and national existence, then to lose 45 or 50 million people, that it's the largest Europe country in Europe after Russia and the land area, that's a big chunk to lose. They have also lost Georgia, they have lost Uzbekistan. They thought they had lost uh, uh, Kazakhstan. Who knows what this, what's going on in Kazakhstan right now? And so this idea that, that Russia is supposed to have this wonderful uh, sphere of influence is not working very well for them. And so that's why they're putting maximum pressure on Ukraine and probably pressure that in many ways a country such as Ukraine can't withstand, to be honest about it, and not because they're a weak country, but because it's just tremendous, tremendous attacks being sent in their way. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of the whole situation, and that's why I'm a big believer. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned that I was uh, the ambassador to the OSCE, but even before that, I was the head of the delegation at the 1992 Helsinki Summit, which wrote the charter for the modern OSCE and we believed very strongly in those days that we were setting up a, again, on Martin Luther King Day today, it's especially important to say it, a democratic foundation for all of these big military and economic arrangements which be done. And Ukraine has done very well in building a democracy. And it's not perfect, it's certainly not totally free of corruption, but it is certainly a much better place to be than living in Russia and from, from the point of view of freedom, of openness, etc. So I think that's what worries Russia about Ukraine. And I think they'll be after it for some time. It's not going to stop. Uh, it's just it's just too much of a threat to them. Professor Schwartz. Quickly, um, I know we're at the time thing. I'd just like to thank Ambassador Kornblum. He's been very reassuring on a lot of issues related to this. I confess that there's still a, a, a modicum of doubt in my own feelings that, in effect, uh, that, that what Putin's going to do is try to destroy the democracy in Ukraine uh, yeah, by, in I effect, uh, just, uh, uh, castrating it, essentially, and, and weakening it by taking territory and by intimidation, and that this will have a very negative effect on other countries in that region and create a sort of sense of fear, especially in the Baltics and other, other countries of Eastern Europe that the Cold War is returning and that the, Soviet, the Russian power is returning to intimidate. So I do worry that we're, we're not in the best position right now to resist as formidably as we were during the Cold War. And I think I worry that this is going to encourage aggression and a bad behavior by states around the world. Well, I don't disagree with you, Tom, um, but I would just go back. Let's if we got five minutes, I'll just think of three things that happened during the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Wall, and the upheavals in Warsaw, Budapest, and Prague. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis was handled by really skillful diplomacy, I think. There are still to this day people who say we should have just torn down the Berlin Wall and then everything would have been okay. It wouldn't have been, by the way, but the and uh, the three um, revolutions in the three capitals, you know, uh, we, should we be honest about this? We essentially abandoned them. 
And so uh, it's not as if the United States, with great leaders such as Dwight Eisenhower, our great general, or the very uh, active John F. Kennedy, it's not as if we were just brilliantly strong and, and turning down every Soviet attack. And the fact is, we weren't very good at it, if you want to be honest about it. What we did do is maintain the status quo. And so I'm not too worried about the fact that we don't seem to be just rolling Putin over. What worries me is more, do we understand what the status quo is? It isn't to try and restore the, a European structure that we agreed 30 years ago. It's a whole new world now, the digital world, as some people call it. And this status quo needs to be a very dynamic and a very moving one. And we're not doing terribly well at that. It's, we have our, our bright people out in California who are you know, establishing almost a parallel government with their uh, institutions. But the Western world is not coming up with the great answers to these, these challenges which are coming. And uh, that's what, what worries me more than whether we're looking tough with Putin or not. I think in the end, Russia is going to not be a, uh, a major factor in the world in, in years coming up, other than to be a disruptive one. And maybe we need to do better in learning how to deal with its disruption. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Ambassador, I've got just one last question. This is uh, somewhat self-serving and we'll probably use this as a testimonial for the value of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. But tell us, uh, again, you mentioned in your remarks why this is important uh, to people, but why, why is staying up to date on uh, foreign affairs and international relations and crises like uh, climate and uh, the issue here with Ukraine, why, why is this important for Americans to understand uh, what's going on in the world? Well, because everything we do now, I mean, back, Patrick, when you and I were, shall we say, younger people, uh, the, we talked about interdependence and we talked about it's important to understand the world. But the fact is, we were pretty autarkic, all of these, all the big countries sort of lived in their own borders. Right now, you can't do that. I can go to my TV set two rooms away here and watch Netflix and Hulu and... Uh, and, and NFL, Titans, of course, uh, uh, every, every day without even, even breaking a sweat. I have, I have the entire world at my command. Uh, the economies of California, of Arizona, of Missouri, and also of Tennessee, of course, are dependent upon what goes on in, uh, in Japan and in Taiwan and in China. And we're just, just no more borders anywhere. And so if that's the case, then we have to learn how to manage these new kinds of connections. It's no longer a question of who's got the biggest army or who's the, who got the loudest voice. It's a matter of who understands how to, how to uh, manage uh, global supply chains. What was the big issue that we had at Christmas time? It wasn't Putin. It wasn't even COVID. It was supply chains. And probably half of Americans had never heard of supply chains before, but they do. everybody knows now what a supply chain is. And so these are the kinds of things which are going to be important in the future. And uh, every single American person, every single German, French, British person, has his life is affected very directly by this all the time. And so if a country like Ukraine, which is not the center of the earth, not the most successful country in the world, but it is, sits there right at the center of Europe between the democratic part of Europe and the not democratic part of Europe. If we allow that country to fall into the, Demo and it wants very much to be part of Western Europe, we shouldn't forget that the crisis which caused Yalta to be occupied was not a NATO crisis. It was the European Union signing what was actually a fairly minor trade and investment agreement with Ukraine. But this apparently got Putin so upset that Ukraine's economy was going to go in a westward direction rather than an eastward direction. That's, that started this whole crisis, which we're still in. So there's not a single one of us who isn't affected every single day by this. And that's why it's important, not that we have to be experts about Ukraine or Taiwan or whatever, but at least to know what the flows of, of, of interest and information are these days. And they're much different than they were even even 20 years ago. 
Well, thank you uh, for that, uh, Ambassador, and thanks to uh, Professor uh, Schwartz. We've had uh, a very stimulating uh, conversation. Uh, uh, Tom and, and John, I, I really appreciate uh, your time today uh, to talk about this important topic. And uh, a reminder to our friends uh, in the audience, uh, you can see the transcript of this program and a recording of the program on our YouTube uh, channel and uh, the, uh, the transcript on tnwac.org. Um, Ambassador, any uh, last uh, comments you'd like to make before we sign off? Well, um, we are talking to the Tennessee World Affairs Council, and I think that ten Nashville in particular, but also Chattanooga, also Knoxville, also Memphis with FedEx, are as good examples as you can find about how a part of the country, which maybe 40 years ago was not exactly seen as a global crossroads has become a global crossroads. And uh, it is not because only of good government or luck or investment, but it's also ha taking place because Tennessee has been a place where these international industries find it useful, not just because it's a nice place, but because it's also very well situated. Uh, and uh, it shows you how important, even a place, again, you know my great affection for Tennessee, but it's a place that 30 years ago was not considered to be one of the economic centers of the United States. Now it is. And much of it is because of uh, globalization, to use that word, which is not always a good word. People don't like it sometimes, but Tennessee has really become a very, very dynamic and important place because it has known how to uh, learn how or known, knew from the beginning how to uh, use these international connections. Well, to that point, I'll just mention uh, that the Tennessee World Affairs Council is working with the Japan America Society of Tennessee on a project uh, to uh, document the importance of Japanese uh, foreign direct investment in Tennessee. And, and uh, people can find uh, the interviews we've been doing with uh, governors and uh, economic development officials and, and others at uh, tnwac.org slash J-A-S-T. Uh, we've got uh, quite a few interviews uh, still to come, but it's an interesting series, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed out uh, the importance of FDI on uh, Tennessee prosperity. Well, that's uh, that's it for us. We've uh, run over, and we appreciate everyone sticking with us. Uh, again, uh, thanks to the American Council on Germany uh, for support in uh, the program and uh, the folks in the audience who are uh, uh, with us today by virtue of their association with ACG. Uh, we appreciate uh, that uh, that support. But that's it for us. This is Global Dialogue from the Tennessee World Affairs Council. You can check the podcast wherever you get podcasts at Global Tennessee. And again, you can find the uh, archive video of this on uh, youtube.com slash TNWAC. I'm Patrick Ryan uh, for the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Thanks to Professor Thomas Schwartz and Ambassador John Kornblum. And everyone have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.